couple of weeks ago, I shared this message, and uh, during this time, we were just we were just talking about uh, about my upcoming trip to to Oklahoma and how anxious I was about it. But since uh, since March, we've been talking a good bit. Since this coronavirus has come in and become a part of our a part of our realities these days, and I really dislike talking about it that much. But it has been, it's been one of those things that has caused a lot of changes, it's caused a lot of people some struggle. People like Dave, who have, who've had, who've had it for months. People that we've seen on, on uh, that we've seen in the news, where they've been sick for months and months, and they finally recover. And there, are, there have been 160,000 who did not. Every single one of us have areas of our lives, whether it is having to do with this current virus is going around, or the, all the uncertainties that go along with it, or whether it's a physical issue that we're dealing with, all of us have issues, have all have areas of our lives where we are struggling. And this is one of those, um, this is one of those topics that uh, we're going to be talking about that this morning, and so God has given me a, a word of encouragement for us this morning as we begin. Now typically, whenever we talk about struggles, we would not put the word glorious and struggle <laughs> together because the word itself, the word glorious, don't you love that font? Oh, yeah. I, I found a new trick. <laughs> and, uh, but the word glorious, when we think about the word glorious, we talk, talk about having, having, having or being worthy of or bringing fame or admiration. Struggles, doing this, not so much. The second one is having a striking beauty or splendor that evokes feeling of delighted admiration. Now, neither of these definitions are what we would attribute to our any struggle that we would find ourselves involved in. Now, what we're going to find today, as we're taking a look at a glorious struggle, we're going to find that Father has a different definition, a different idea concerning struggles than what we do. We are going to begin with a question that people have been asking since the dawn of time. And that question is, why do bad things happen to good people? And we, we wonder about that. And again, we think, well, good people, well, what exactly is good? It's not like none of us are perfect, but that's not exactly bad either, but not certainly not bad enough to deserve bad things to happen. But there are people that we know that have had, have had to endure such difficult struggles over the course of time. And it's not like they are bad people. So we ask the question, why do good things, why do bad things happen to good people? And so that question, some, some people will answer that and say, well, it goes back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam sinned, the whole world fell into, fell into where we have heartache and trouble. Apart from before, before sin entered the world, it was, didn't exist. And so we can go back and we can, uh, we can blame, blame it on Adam. But the word also says here in Job, it says, man is born to trouble as surely as the sparks fly upward. And this is, this is by Eliphaz. And uh, whether that is the actual, the way it has to be or not, but it is the way it seems. Every single one of us. Now, is there one person here in this room that have, has never encountered a struggle? And never encountered trouble? So, man is born to trouble, it would seem. Now, there are examples here in the world that we're going to be taking a look at this morning of people who've had difficult uh, circumstances enter their lives, and it would appear through no fault of their own. The first one we're going to take a look at is, is Joseph. We're all very, very familiar with this, with this story, and it is from Genesis 30, chapter 37 through 50. And we're not going to take the time to read all of that. But we are very familiar with the story of Joseph. Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob. At 17, his brothers 
sold him into slavery. By the time he was 30, he was the second in command of, of Egypt. How long was Joseph in prison? We don't know for certain how long it was. We do know that when he went to Egypt, he was, he was purchased by Potiphar, and he served for some time in Potiphar's house, whether it's one year or up to three years. So a reasonable estimate of him being in prison was between 10 and 12 years for doing nothing wrong. This was a very difficult, <coughs> difficult circumstance for him. Another example is, is, is this man. And we talk about Job. We talk about the patience of Job. We talk about, talk about the suffering of Job. Job, as you know, was a, is a, was a wealthy man, a God-fearing man. And in the space of a very short time frame, his wealth is gone. His children die. Everything he has is taken away from him. And then his health is taken as well. What, he, what, is he, what is he left with? He's left with a wife and three friends who are really no comfort to him at all. And so they have this conversation as they're going along. We know that these, both of these stories turn out okay. They, they end well. This is a verse that we, this is one of those comforting verses. It says, Moreover, we know that to those that, who love God, who are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. We know that God causes all things to work together for good. That is the NIV version. This is the Philip translation here. That God is causing all of these difficulties to weave together, to fit into a pattern that is going to be for our good. And this verse, when we're, when we're in the midst of a struggle, in the midst of a difficult circumstance, it's like a quilt that we wrap ourselves in. It's a promise that we are reminding ourselves and God of what, he, of what, he, of what he's doing. And yet, we still find ourselves oftentimes on our knees crying out, crying out to God. And I've said this so many, many times. It's not, it's, God grants us grace in these difficult times, but we don't want grace. What do we want? We want deliverance. We want to be, we want to be delivered out of it. Our minds are, are racing with, with different questions as we are, as we are in struggling against something that is unwinnable, something that we can't, we can't stop. And we wonder, what could possibly be the purpose of this thing that I'm going through? What possible benefit could this difficult circumstance produce in my life? What how am I supposed to benefit from this? And then we almost become accusatory. And we say, if God truly cared, why is this happening? You know, you can almost, you can almost hear, this is very similar. This is very similar to what, to what Satan said to Eve. We can almost hear him whisper in our ears, if he truly cared, why are you suffering like this? He may say he cares, but does he really? Depending on the depth of, of, the, of the struggle, depending on the severity of the, of the uh, circumstance, we find ourselves questioning these things. These are very, very difficult questions that, that we find ourselves, that are, we find weighing down on us. And there are no easy answers. Every one of us can think back to certain periods in our lives, certain circumstances, and you wonder, why is this happening? How am I supposed to get through this? The fact is, is that our pasts are replete with many, many circumstances, many, many painful moments, events that, that, that brought us to our knees, brought us to our knees and changed our lives forever. And all of these events are littered 
across our paths. It could be as children, as adults, there are, there are, there's abuse that takes place, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional, whether you've not had the proper care extended to you that, that, that you should have had, or whether it is a whether it's something that it was was an occasional mistreatment or something that was ongoing and continual. There are people who live in this. People who have survived it. It could be the law. It could be that a, a season of loss. As we as we are going through, it could be we could have lost our home, and that could be through uh, through losing our job and becoming homeless, or it could be through uh, some sort of catastrophe like a fire or a flood. We could be that we've lost family members over the course of time, either through death or desertion. In, as, as life goes on, we have these, these kind of things go on. It could be that we've lost our possessions, again, through a catastrophe where everything is, is lost, where you have absolutely nothing. Or, or you have... Uh, You've, it's been stolen along the way. It could be a loss of a reputation. As adults, a loss of reputation can be devastating over the course of time. And that could be through an indiscretion, or it could be through a misunderstanding, or it could just be through the malicious nature of other people around you. We can all, we've also can lose trust. We can lose trust in, in the people that, that we should... That we should uh, those people that we care about. We can lose trust in the institution that, that we serve our community. We can lose trust in God himself. We lose relationships. And that can be with our parents, with our siblings, with our spouse, or with those people in our community. There's also the business of disease. Disease is another one of those things that, that, that come into our lives uninvited. It could be a family member. It could be yourself. It could be something sudden, like an, like an accident or a, or a suicide along the way. It could be something terminal, like a disease that comes in, like what, like what happened to my, my sister whenever I was young, what happened to my first wife, and they, a disease comes and it takes them. It could be something chronic, like heart disease. Like my father, my father dealt with over the course of time. It could be like diabetes that, that Ian, that we deal with with him. These are things that come into our lives. It could be mental illness, like the dementia that robbed, that robbed my family and my mom over the course of time. All of these things come into our lives, and they, and they cause us to struggle. There are also disappointments. You think, really, my disappointments? Disappointments can be devastating. It can be the loss of a dream, like Joseph. Joseph had so many dreams. It could be that there was a career out there that you really wanted, but I, given the, the circumstance, you made a choice, and that dream has slipped away from you. It could be that there is a betrayal that has happened to you over the course of time. Someone who should have cared, who should have, should have been there for you, wasn't. It could be ridicule. It could be vilification. It could be those harsh words that come at us and from people that we aren't expecting. These are things that litter our past. These are things that change our lives. These are things that we have to deal with. But Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And we take comfort in these words. But... We, are, we still find ourselves dealing with the effects of the struggle. When we are burdened down, when we are caught in the middle of it, we struggle with what's happening. The word is full. As I was preparing for this, I told Marcy, it's, a, it's astonishing how many verses there are that deal with the suffering that, that, we, that we endure, the suffering that comes into our lives. And so many words of encouragement as, uh, as you leap through the pages. There are a couple specific examples here in the scriptures that I want, that I want to take a look at. And these are the things that are going to change 
the way we think about the struggles that we have, where they truly might be a glorious struggle. The first one we're going to take a look at is in John 9. And this is the man born blind. And this is John 9, verses 1 through 3. And it says there, it says, as, uh, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who didn't born blind. And his father was asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused this man to be born blind? His own sin or that of his parents? You see, this was a, this was a, common, a common belief during that time. Bad things happen to bad people. Bad things don't happen to good people. If there, is, if there is some sort of sickness or some sort of trouble in your life, what happened? You caused it. This is what, this is what Job's comforters are saying. Well, what sin have you committed that you have been, that you have been afflicted so? These, his, his disciples, centuries later, still asking that same question. And that same thought process runs around in our head. If I'm real good, bad things won't happen. Or if I slip up, I'm looking for something bad to happen. You know it's true. It happens. That's the way we are. But Jesus answered. He said, it is not this man's sin or his parents' sin that made him blind. This man was born blind so that God's power could be shown in him. Chosen from birth to be born blind so that this moment could happen. And every one of us are saying, wait a second. That's not fair. That's not fair. What do you mean? Are you tired? We struggle so that God's power can be shown? That's what Jesus was saying. He said, this man, there was not, it's not a matter of wrongdoing. This man was born blind so that this moment could happen. Do we struggle so God's power can be seen? The answer to that question is, Sometimes. Yes, that is the case. Sometimes we have a scriptural precedent here for us. Are there, are there difficult times that come into our lives so that God can show his power? Yes, sometimes. Another example I want us to take a look at is, the, is Lazarus. And this is in John chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 43. Again, I'm not going to read, read the whole thing. I'm just going to give you the synopsis. Uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were good friends of Jesus. They lived in Bethany, uh, just a few miles out of Jerusalem. Jesus was a frequent visitor to their house, and he loved them very much. Well, Mary and Lazarus got sick, and Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus where, where he was, and said, your friend Lazarus is sick. In fact, he's almost dead. We need you to come quickly. And Jesus answered, he said, this sickness will not end in death. Okay, so he's speaking from his, from his knowledge. Uh, it is for the glory of God. This sickness is for the glory of God, to bring glory to the Son of God. And so he stays two more days. Lazarus is de deathly sick. And Jesus stays two more days. And then one day he says, uh, he says, it, it's, it's, time, it's time to go to Bethany. Uh, Lazarus is sleeping. And his disciples say, listen, listen, Jesus. If Lazarus is sleeping, it's a good thing. They didn't understand, so Jesus put it out there plainly. He says, Lazarus is dead. And, uh, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so you may you may believe. I, do you see what do you see what I'm saying here? I am glad I was not there. How is that right? 
But that's what the word says. This sickness is not unto death. This sickness is so that the glory of God can be seen, so that the Son of Man may be glorified. And I was, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. And this flies in the face of a lot of preaching that goes on. This business of the of naming it and then claiming it and all of those kind of things. And the word doesn't back that up. Sometimes these things happen for other reasons. Are you saying then that we struggle through heartache so that others may believe? Mary and Martha had to struggle and watch Lazarus get sicker and sicker and draw his last breath and then grieve for four days. Did, and Lazarus had to endure this sickness and this business of feeling bad in the, and then physically dying so that the glory of God might be, might be seen so that others could believe. Are our struggles, do we struggle then so that others may believe? Those things that come into our lives, is it, so that, is it for the sake of others? Sometimes, yes, sometimes, these are glorious struggles. Max Lucado is one of my favorite authors, and this is a book that I, that I just finished reading. I finished it a few weeks ago, and uh, it's probably the, it's the second or third time I've read through it. But as I was reading through it, it, it planted a seed down inside of me because he deals with these two stories in this book. I'm saying, wait a second, Father, there's a problem. <laughs> We've got a problem here. Because it's, it flies in the face of, 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 my, of what I want. It doesn't fly in the face of what the Word says. It flies in the face of what I want to believe. The subtitle for this book is Rescue from the Life We Thought Would Make Us Happy. This is not a popular saying. It's not about you. We say it all the time. Do we want to hear it to a, said to ourselves? No, we don't want to hear it directed toward us. We will direct it to other people. But it's not about me. Chapter 12 deals particularly with the business of struggling. Okay? My struggles are not about me. My struggles are about him. And that's where we need to come today. We need to come to this realization that my struggles are not about me. My struggles are about him and what he's doing. And here in chapter 12, some of the quotes that I have here, page uh, 122, is he says, he makes this comment. He says, your pain has a purpose. Your problems, struggles, heartaches, and hassles cooperate toward one end, the glory of God. He goes on and says, is there any chance, any possibility that you have been selected, chosen to struggle for God's glory? The word says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. Have you been selected to suffer? Have you been granted, this is Philippians 1 9, have you been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake? You see, folks, the struggles we go through have a purpose, have a, there's part of this part of a plan. Are people strengthened by your struggles? I can look through this room and I, and, I, and I know the stories of so many. And yes, I have been strengthened by your struggles. And you've been strengthened by mine. Max tells a story in this book about a man, a man from his church, Max pastors down in San Antonio. A man in his church, he has, he has terminal cancer, and he is 
fading. He is, he is not feeling well. And he's wondering, why is this happening? Where is God in all of this? And he, because of his pain, uh, because of his struggle, <coughs> And he and he was he was asking he was asking his pastor these questions, and Max re gave him this response. He says, "It's not about you." I told him, "Your hospital room is a showcase for your Maker. Your faith in the face of suffering cranks up the volume of God's song." We live in a community. We have a, a, a circle of acquaintances, of friends, of people around us. And they're watching us. They watch how we cope with these struggles along the way. This man in the hospital caught hold of this truth. And he began to reflect the grace of God, the, the comfort of Christ. And he became a witness to everyone who came in. And he bore his sufferings, and he died with a purpose. He was able to understand that the suffering, the pain, the discomfort, the struggle was not about him. It's about what God was doing through him in the lives of others. Do we truly believe this? Or do we just say that we do? Is it easier to, to endure when you're in the midst of these very difficult times? And as you look and you think back across your, your memory and all of those difficult, horrific days, <coughs> is it easier to endure knowing that your pain has a purpose? Once we take the take the focus off of how it's affecting us, it becomes easier sometimes. If we can catch a glimpse of how God views it, the word says, and this is uh, here in Psalm 50, the word says, and call on me in the day of trouble. And we have no problems calling out to God when we're, when we're facing a difficult time. Even people who never pray, when they find themselves pressed against the face of the rock, they will call upon the name of God, the one that they don't believe in. If you're, out, if you're truly out there, he's telling us, call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. Like Joseph, like Job. Again, not out of it, but through it. And you shall glorify me. Out of this thing shall come glory. I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. What are we facing right now? We've talked a lot about, uh, over the course of these last several weeks, the business of what's happening in our, in our nation, what's happening in our land, what's happening in our community. We have so many things going on. We have the COVID-19, we have social unrest, we have the political climate going on, there's those arguments taking place. We have school opening, when you have no idea what we're going to be walking into. We have the business of going out, being uneasy to go and eat in restaurants anywhere, being careful when we go out, because we don't want to get sick. There are health issues that we deal with. Our sister-in-law has been, has been diagnosed with terminal cancer, and her numbers keep going up. They, they keep giving chemotherapy, and her numbers continue to go up. It's not looking good. It becomes like a death sentence that, is, that, has been, that has been handed down. We all, I look across this room, I'm wearing a shield, everyone in here has a mask on. Why? This is what we call PPE. 
Last year, I would never, never would have imagined something called PPE in, in, my, in my world. Sounds like a dangerous chemical I spray on the lawn. <laughs> but it's personal protection equipment. And we live with it. We have to deal with social distancing. We have to deal with, there are, there are many people who deal with chronic conditions. I mean, they just pain and, and health issues that just do not go away. Dealing with, uh, dealing with relationships, whether it's at home or whether it's at work or whether it's in our community. We have just, we have endured these periods of isolation where we have, we're not allowed to even get close to each other. When was the last time you hugged a stranger? Hug somebody who didn't live in your house. We're so very, very careful. We are isolated. We have actually had what we call quarantine fatigue. And that's taking its toll on relationships. For those, for those, for those family relationships that weren't strong in the, to begin with, being stuck together in the same house for days on end is causing significant issues. We're also, we also have to deal with stability issues. Will the, will the grocery store have, Marcy was just saying, it's hard to find bacon these days. Because the, our supply chains have been disrupted. We have trouble finding we had trouble going to stores and them want, not wanting to take cash because they don't have any coins. These are, this, there's a stability, there's an economic stability. Will our jobs still be there? As teachers, we know our jobs will, will be there, at least for this year. But there are many, many uh, people in this, uh, in this area whose jobs are, are tenuous. The business of being able to, to pay for our home, being able to make the mortgage payment or the rent payments, being able to pay for utilities, all of those things become very tenuous. Those things that we've taken for granted for so long begin to have an emotional and a mental toll on us. And so stability becomes an issue here in, the, in our present day. Paul was very, very familiar with suffering. And as he is a and he, as he's writing to the Romans here in Romans 8, he says, he says, in my opinion, whatever we may have to go through now is less than nothing compared to the magnificent future God has planned for us. Regardless of what we're going through here and now, as difficult as it seems, is less than than nothing compared with what Father has planned for us. In Romans 5 it says, but wait, that's not all. We gladly suffer. Wait a second. <laughs> Paul was saying this, okay, and again, from where, he's, from where he was standing, he realized, it's not about me. We gladly suffer because we know that suffering helps us to endure. And endurance builds character, which gives us a hope that will never disappoint us. What is the purpose of these struggles? What's the purpose of these, of these, of these difficult circumstances? What does it form in us? It gives us hope. In a very hopeless time, it gives us hope hope. But back to our original question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Jesus was very plain. He was perfectly clear. No ambiguity whatsoever here. He said, he said in this world you will have trouble. As I was preparing, as I was preparing for, for this message this morning, I was reading a, a different Max Lucado book and found a, a different, a different uh, analogy that he was using concerning this. Why do bad things happen to good people? He simply said, and he made this analogy, if you, are, if you are living in a war zone or living on a battlefield, you can expect to suffer some damage. And that made, that made perfect sense to me. 
On May 31st, we talked about being in the midst of a storm, and we, again, with everything going on around us, it feels like there's there's a storm going on, and we made this we made the statement that. Just because I'm in the storm, the storm doesn't have to be in me. That comes from a song that, that's on the radio right now. And last week, we talked, about, we talked about the gates of hell and how those gates do not move. They do not chase us. Yes, we live in difficult times. And there are points and times when we're, where we go on the offensive and we take it to the gates of hell. And they will not Stand. They will not prevail. We've talked a lot in these past several weeks about spiritual warfare. The business of uh, all around us, there's an unseen, there's an unseen battle. We live in enemy territory, and the battle that goes on around us is very real, both on the physical level, on the spiritual level, on the emotional level. We are engaged in a battle, and we are going to feel the effects of of that battle. Here is the truth of the matter. We live in a fallen world and suffer the consequences that go with it. The world in which we live is broken. And that does come from the choice of a man. That does come from the fall. We, we personally did not create this mess we did not create this turmoil. We did not create this world. We don't endorse it. We don't, we don't stand by its practices and its beliefs. And we try our best not to participate in what's going on in the world. But it is where we're going to spend all of our days. Living in, in enemy territory. Living. Living as a as a person just passing through. There are days, some of those days, will feel like we are walking through the bowels of the furnace, like the, three, like the three Hebrew children. Through no fault of their own, we're cast in. Peter said, don't be surprised or shocked that you are going through testing that is like walking through fire. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. It is, it is where we live. Or it could be, other days could be spent in the, the throes of despair. Where things are just, just don't look like they're going to, to work out. There are circumstances beyond our, beyond our control, circumstances that we cannot change. And it could be due to, uh, due to getting a bad diagnosis. It could be from losing your job, it could be from any number of things, bad news along the way. Perhaps, perhaps it is that, that you are suffering from chronic pain. My stepfather lived in pain constantly. It could be that there is, a, there, there is emotional turmoil that, that is going on, so it could be something that's happened in the past, something that's happened recently, but there's something emotional that's going on and, and keeping you stirred up. As I said a couple weeks ago, anxiety is one of those things that I have to deal with, particularly when I have to travel, and this time it worked out, it worked out pretty well, because I got to stay at home doing what I do best, and she got to drive. She got to drive out there and uh, spend time on the road. It could be discouragement. Over the course of time, we've just been discouraged. We've been disappointed over the, over the course of time. And it could be that we have just disillusioned because the things that we thought were going to happen isn't happening. After all, you just found out this morning that Jesus was glad he wasn't there when Lazarus was dying. We found out this morning that, you know, sometimes those things are happening because there's a particular moment in time where God's going to do a miracle. David understood this when he wrote here in Psalm 43. He says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? He's talking to himself. 
And he said, he, he understands, I am so upset, I'm so downcast. Why are you in, why are you in despair? Why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God. What did Paul say was the, was the purpose of our struggles, was the purpose of our trouble? It was to build and to bring what in us? Hope. The struggle is what brings us hope as we endure. Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. And this is one of those verses that I have, I have, I have held on to over the course of years. Having gone through what I lived with within Michigan with my first wife dying, there is a there is a truth to be found here. He gives us comfort in our trials so that we in turn may be able to give that same sort of strong sympathy to others in theirs. We experience things in our lives. And the comfort that we have received in those times is the same comfort that we can extend. I am far better able to minister to the needs of certain people because of the experiences that I've had. When I can truly say to them, I, I understand. I've walked that road. I know that desperation. I have, I have been in this place. And while my circumstance may have been a little different, I have empathy. I have sympathy. I can relate to what, you, to what you're going through. And you know what? God is faithful. When I was walking through those first, those first few months after being widowed, I didn't want comfort. I wanted my wife back. And they said, you know, time. I, and I didn't want time. But they were right. Time does bring some healing. We comfort those. We comfort others with the comfort that we receive. As I look back across my life, I look back across what Mars and I have endured here with, the, with our kids and whatnot, we can better, far better relate what other people go, are going through. And we can also be a testimony to God's faithfulness as to Him providing what, what we needed in those moments. Paul goes on here and says, indeed, experience shows that the more we share Christ's sufferings, the more we are able to give of His encouragement. And this is one of those puzzles in Scripture when it talks about being able to participate in the sufferings of Christ. We know that Christ suffered on the cross. We know that he suffered during, during leading, up to those, leading up to those moments, those hours on the cross. Peter puts it like this. He says, indeed, this is a tough scripture for us, folks. This is part of your calling. What is? For Christ suffered for you and left you a personal example, and he wants you to follow in his step. There is one of these suffering that comes into our lives. There's one of the struggles that come into our lives, and this is part of our calling. This is what we've been called to. Every single person is going to face struggles. But as believers, we suffer with a purpose, and that is for the glory of God. Jesus, Jesus suffered, went to the cross. He, he died for us through no fault of his own. He didn't complain, as, uh, as, we, as we talked about before, and without, he accepted this cross without resisting, contending, or disputing. You've heard that before. It was in 2018 that we talked about that. And when we're talking about the fruits of the Spirit, that is meekness, which is the character of Christ, which is what He has placed within each one of us. It is part of your calling to participate in His suffering. 
And what about our future? So far, 2020 has been a real humdinger. <laughs> and what do we have to look forward to? Well, we have the elections coming up, and I'm telling you, I am so tired of listening to it already. We have, um, <laughs> uh, we have employment challenges. We don't know exactly what's going to be happening with our economy, how things are, are going to be going. We have, we have health issues. Will our PPE be effective? Yeah. And our relationships. As we move it back into uh, back into some semblance of normalcy or whatever this new normal is, these are things that are, are out there. We don't know exactly what they're going to look like, but we do know this. We do know that our light and momentary troubles, those things that we are experiencing now that are really less than nothing are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about what God is doing. David says like this, and it takes a lot of courage, it takes a strong relationship to be able to say this. It was good for me to be afflicted. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. In other words, the pain, the suffering, those difficult circumstances, those, those days, those nights when I didn't think I was going to make it through, were good. Because it showed me God's heart. It showed me his plan for my life. It showed me his character because in resting in him, I have hope. And one day, when I see him face to face, well, <laughs> one day when I see him face to face, whatever tears I may have had, Whatever, whatever difficulties I may, I may have remembered, God himself will wipe every tear from my eyes. Death shall be no more, and never again shall there be sorrow or crying or pain, for all those former things are past and gone. Remember that quilt we talked about at the beginning? That one that we wrap around ourselves? That we know that God causes all things to work together for good. For those who are called in, according to his purpose. I like the way that Philip says it. It says everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. That God is do, putting things together. And he's weaving it together. We know. We know that God causes all these things to work together for good. It may look rather hopeless at the moment, but Father has a plan, and it's a good one. This is another one of those scriptures that we hold on to. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. It's more than just a verse we pull out when we're, when we're feeling uncertain. It's more than just a more than just a promise to them that we hope is true. We know that God's, that God's promises are yes and amen. And this in 1 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. I'm going to finish here with uh, going back to just another couple of quotes from uh, Max Licato. And that is, rather than begrudge your problem, explore it. Ponder it. And most of all, use it. We may not like the circumstance we find ourselves in. We may not look forward to the days of trouble and the turmoil that that's going to cause. But rather than begrudge the problem, 
explore it, ponder it, and use it to the glory of God. God sets all of these things in our, in our lives for a purpose and a plan. And the plan is not about you. There are people around you who are watching. And we live our lives as a showcase for God's, for God's glory, for God's grace, for his work in other people. Troubles are not pleasant, but they can be glorious. Father, your word, your word is true. And Father, there are some difficult, difficult things in there. And we, and as you bring those out, it kind of, it kind of shakes us up and almost slaps us in the face. But Jesus, we know that you suffered for us. And so, Lord Jesus, we then, we submit ourselves to you and to participate in your sufferings. Your suffering is, you're, you're, you had said that if you were lifted up, you would draw all men unto you. Lord Jesus, we ask that you will glorify yourselves in our lives. And Father, as we are walking through these very difficult times, these struggles, these uh, these perilous times of, that, we, that we face, I ask, Father, that you would remind us that the, this pain has a purpose. The this, this struggle will end. But Lord Jesus, we ask that you, will be dis, that you will be exalted through them. Father, help us to live our lives so before men that they will see our good works and give praise to your name. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen and amen.